Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPD to advance excellent teaching. It was Catholic against Protestant, dynasty against dynasty, people against people in the age of the Reformation. Civil war, foreign war, engulfed nearly every power in Europe until the interests of the state triumphed over the interests of faith. The wars of religion, this time on the Western tradition. Now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. Edward Gibbon, the great English historian who died 200 years ago, called history the register of the crimes, follies, and misfortunes of mankind. Now of all of these, the 16th and 17th centuries gathered a specially rich harvest. The Protestant Reformation opened a Pandora's box of international and civil conflicts that we call wars of religion. Wars of religion because religion was either their cause or their excuse. Central and Northern Europe, England and Scotland and France, all of them found themselves involved in wars with one another or else in internal struggles with Protestant against Catholic, Catholic against Protestant, sometimes Protestant against Protestant and Catholic against Catholic. Uh, behind the religious issue, however, there stood other cru crucial interests, rival dynasties, like those that ruled in France or Spain, rival social orders, peasants against lords in Germany, cities against their overlords in the Netherlands, princes against the emperor in Germany, nobles against the crown in England, in France. But these political struggles were more fierce because the opposition of faiths introduced a complicating fact. Few men can be crueler than would-be martyrs who have escaped the executioner's axe. By the 1530s, the cantons of Switzerland had fought a bloody civil war and settled into a division between Protestant and Catholic cantons, which still endures today. And in 1555, the German states ended an entire generation of religious conflict by signing the Peace of Augsburg. As in Switzerland, this was simply an agreement to disagree and to localize the conflict as far as possible. The Peace of Augsburg was no more lasting than any other peace. It kept a sort of truce for half a century but its importance lay in the formula on which it was based. Cuius regio, eius religio. The religion of the ruler shall be the religion of his subjects. So unity in religion had become an element in the unity of the state. Everybody in one state must belong to the same church or get out. And this replaced the universal Christian church of the Middle Ages with a model of national conformity and international diversity. But just as Central Europe got a breathing space, Western Europe began to get into trouble. In England in 1535, King Henry VIII broke with Rome because he wanted a divorce from his wife who hadn't produced a male heir. 
but the Pope wouldn't approve the divorce. So in the Reformation settlement, Henry set up his own national church, the Church of England. He became the first sovereign prince to take over the Roman church, subject it openly and totally to the state, and use its property to strengthen the crown and the crown's supporters. This Reformation settlement remained uncertain for 150 years, and it contributed to a lot of insecurity in England. But Henry's second daughter, Queen Elizabeth I, who was crowned in 1558, helped to stabilize the situation by introducing a new idea, tolerance in return for payment. You were allowed to worship in your own way, but you had to do it in private, and you had to pay for it, because it was a privilege to be different from everybody else. Elizabeth and her successors didn't really trust the Catholics, not because they had a different faith, but because their faith made some of them function as a fifth column of England's Catholic enemies, especially Spain. So Elizabeth kept her eye on them, and she fined them, but she also gave up the attempt to secure uniformity by force, and she made a virtue from necessity, or at least a profit. Meanwhile, trouble was brewing in France and in the Netherlands. Political problems and religious problems there produced an explosive mixture which blew up in the 1560s and 70s. It led to an almost endless series of wars for the rest of the century, with French fighting French, Belgians fighting the Dutch, the English helping the Protestants both in Holland and in France, and the Spaniards fighting everybody at one time or another. Catholic France had been burning Protestant reformers since the 1520s. But Protestantism also attracted quite a number of French nobles who found it a convenient stalking horse against the crown which had been getting stronger at their expense. French Protestants were called Huguenots from the German term for Confederates and politically they often represented a feudal reaction against the encroaching centralized state. But Catholicism was popular in France, and the Catholic party had the advantage of Spanish subsidies, so the civil war dragged on, marked by small battles and big massacres. The most famous massacre took place on St. Bartholomew's night in August 1572, and on the following day, killing several thousand Protestants in Paris and the provinces. The Pope, when he heard the news, ordered a te deum, a hymn of praise, and declared that the massacre pleased him more than 50 victories against the Turks. Philip II of Spain also rejoiced. It said that this was the only time in his life when he laughed. Not all the power of Philip, however, could prevent the Protestants of the Netherlands from freeing themselves from Spanish Catholic rule. Under the leadership of William of Orange, they separated from the southern Belgian provinces, which remained Catholic, and set up a new free state called the United Provinces, also known as Holland, from the name of the biggest and richest of these provinces. Having lost a good chunk of the Netherlands, Philip now tried to find compensation by winning greater influence in France, perhaps by getting control of France as the protector of the Catholic party there. But with all the help he gave the French Catholics, Philip could not prevent a Huguenot prince from succeeding to the French throne, Henry of Bourbon, Prince of Béarn in the Pyrenees, who was next in line of succession.
there was more civil war in France and it devastated the country, it came to an end only when Henry decided to become a Catholic, declaring that Paris was worth a mass. Conversion seemed to be the only way to secure unity for France and to get the crown for himself, and it worked. In 1594, Henry entered Paris, which had resisted him as long as he remained a Huguenot. He was crowned as Henry IV, and he united both Catholics and Huguenots against the Spanish enemy. And after another three years of war, he forced the Spaniards to make peace. But Henry's biggest task was to establish peace inside France. On the same day that the peace with Spain was signed, May the 2nd, 1598, he promulgated the famous Edict of Nantes, named after the city where it was signed. This was to serve as the base of religious peace in France until Louis XIV revoked it about a century later. The edict succeeded because it made the Catholics feel they had won and it made the Huguenots feel secure since they were allowed to worship in their own fashion. And for the next hundred years, the Huguenots were going to contribute much that was vital and worthwhile to France's economy, its politics, and its culture. Now, if I may leave the Huguenots busy contributing, I want to say a few things about one of the most important results of this series of conflicts, conflicts which you realize were mainly civil wars. They were internal struggles in which religious dissensions threatened again and again to tear a country apart, to destroy political and social unity for the sake of religious unity and belief, to undermine the power of the state and the welfare of society for the sake of the church, and to massacre great numbers of people for the greater glory of God. Not surprisingly, there was a reaction to this bloody waste, a reaction most clearly reflected in the appearance of a point of view, eventually of a group of men known as the politiques. And politiques is a term that I might best define as sagacious, prudent men interested in government that works. And the rise and the influence of the politics towards the end of the 16th century was really the most notable sign of the times. The very fact that politics existed testified to the fact that for a lot of people, the religion of the state, the state as a symbol of order and stability, this was starting to look more important than the religion of the church. Or... Alternately, you might say that religion was becoming more individual, more of a private affair, while the civil, secular state power was recognized as having more immediate claims, more pressing claims than those of the church. In the great crisis of the Reformation, religious people had felt that everything had to give way to the interests of religion. But now, the politics felt that everything had to give way to the interests of the state. And the most important of these interests, given the terrible effects of civil war, was national unity. And if toleration of other religions was necessary to keep the country together, then all right, they would be tolerant. Now, this was something new. Truth has always appeared indivisible. You cannot allow untruth to survive. You cannot be neutral between good and evil. Martin Luther, after he had sowed his wild oats, neither desired nor believed in tolerance. 
John Calvin never dreamt about it. You were either a persecutor or else persecuted. And there was nothing the persecuted liked so much as becoming persecutors. But for the politiques and for princes like Henry IV, tolerance was an instrument of state. They didn't say that persecution was always wrong. They just said that tolerance was sometimes right. Their attitude was, let's see if it works. After all, it didn't look as if either the French Protestants or the Catholics were really strong enough to beat the other into submission. So, you find a gradual development of the view that you cannot identify loyalty with orthodoxy, that in Catholic France, a man could be a Protestant and a good Frenchman too. A similar attitude developed in Protestant England, where Queen Elizabeth and her ministers were much more interested in the welfare of the country than in what language they were going to hear religious service. There was persecution of Catholics in England, but they were not persecuted because they were Catholics, but because they wanted to undermine the Queen and the constitution of the country. A Catholic could be a Catholic as long as he stayed at home and didn't conspire against the Queen, which is much the same idea as lay behind the Edict of Nantes. You can see how novel this was by contrasting it to the Spanish Inquisition, which was established a century earlier in 1479. The Inquisition didn't just want to get rid of a heretic because he was a danger to society. It was interested in his soul. It might have to torture him into salvation, but it would do its best to save him, even in spite of himself. The politics, however, didn't care about a man's soul. They only cared about his power or his nuisance value, and they were prepared to come to terms with reality, provided they could get practical results, that is, the unity, stability, security of the state. And to further these interests, they were ready to ignore the interests or the orders of the church, any church, they were ready to ignore the church for the sake of the nation. So the wars of religion paradoxically led to a downgrading of the importance of religion. It dwindled into one department of life. It became a private matter, not immediately, but gradually. Until in the 19th century, we find a Victorian politician remarking that things have come to a pretty pass if religion is going to interfere with private life. And this is an idea which no medieval man could possibly have entertained or understood. Still, the so-called wars of religion were not over yet. The greatest of them and the last was going to be the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648. This drew in almost every power in Europe, Swedes and Danes, Germans, Bohemians, Spaniards and Frenchmen. It started when Ferdinand of Bohemia ascended the throne in 1617, determined to restore his lands to Catholicism and to revoke the religious freedoms of Bohemian Protestants. Within a few years, the conflict escalated into international warfare. Armies, as usual, did more harm to the civilian population than to each other, but things got so bad that even the soldiers suffered, as you can see in these engravings by the French artist Jacques Callot. William Harvey, the English physician, the same man who discovered the circulation of the blood, traveled across Central Europe during the war and noted that by the way, we could scarcely see a dog, crow, kite, raven or any bird 
or anything to anatomize, only some few miserable people, the relics of the war and the plague, where famine had made anatomies before I came. As the great English poet Milton asked, what can war but endless war still breed? The only hope in this sort of situation is exhaustion. And by 1648, everybody was exhausted. It had been the worst catastrophe in Central Europe since the Black Death of the 14th century. The fighting finally came to an end with the Treaty of Westphalia, which reasserted the right of each ruler to determine his land's religion. It confirmed the territorial sovereignty of Germany's many principalities, which would serve to perpetuate German division and political weakness. It confirmed the position of France as a great European power, and it confirmed the decline of Spain. But the treaty also made clear the declining importance of religion. Although the Thirty Years' War started out Catholic against Protestant, it ended with two chief contenders, both of whom were Catholic, France and Spain. Catholic had fought Catholic, Protestant had fought Protestant according to national or dynastic interests. And so the last war of religion was also the first, ultimately, to ignore religion. The fighting, the misery, the suffering had dulled religious sensibilities. And besides, after 1648, Catholic and Protestant positions were pretty much stabilized anyway. If you look at the map, you can also see a curious coincidence. On the whole, the territory of the old Roman Empire stays Roman Catholic, the barbarian lands beyond the borders of Rome are Protestant, which suggests how profoundly some structures can affect culture over the centuries. There are exceptions to this pattern, of course, but the general lines are clear. Equally clear to contemporaries was the fact that the great mass of people would eventually accept whatever was given or imposed by their rulers including religion. They might rebel at times, but it was usually about bread or taxes, not higher principles. Material reality and their precarious existence weigh too heavily upon them. Their horizons were narrow, their submission traditional, and this worked in favor of the established authority, whatever its creed or its political color. The people were there to be used and manipulated by a tiny political class and would remain so for a very long time. In a later program, we shall see the further evolution of established authority into the absolute monarchies of the 17th century. But even as the dynastic states were coming into their own, a greater novelty was taking shape, the republican patriotism of the United Provinces of Holland, which had cast off Spanish rule. So from this point on, patriotism did not have to identify with a dynasty. It could identify with a free community that described itself as a res publica, which literally means the common thing or the common good, or as the English called it, the commonwealth. The Dutch set up the first modern commonwealth in the 16th century, and the English tried to imitate them in the 17th century. And these fragile models founded on the ideal of citizen freedom and citizen wealth or wealth-being 
were particularly important for the Western tradition because they foretold the republics of the 18th and 19th centuries, including our own republic. And equally significant was their growth out of and around cities, the direct successors of medieval city-states and the centers of new and vital economic activity. We shall take a closer look at this phenomenon next time because while wars and politics are important, there are also less obvious forces at work that affect the outcome of wars and that affect how most people live. And these are economic forces whose base in the modern world is in urban society, as we shall see in our next program, when we leave the path of armies and princes and follow the path of money instead. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.